Welcome uh, to another opportunity to gather uh, in this format uh, to hear from, from God uh, and connect with one another and just hear some of the things that are happening around New Song Church as we pursue our mission in these very different uh, times. Uh, if you're joining us perhaps for the first time or you've been uh, connecting for a while but we don't know who you are, we'd love to know uh, something about you. Uh, there's a chance to fill in an online digital connect card uh, and we would uh, love to hear from you. Uh, even let us know what's going on with you, how we can be praying for you, and hopefully how we can connect on into the future. Um, in the next hour or so, uh, we're going to hear the next in our series on First Peter, this amazing letter that's written by one of Jesus' disciples uh, to his friends uh, all around the known world at that time, who were going through a really difficult and challenging time, and Peter is calling them to remember who they are in Christ, and that will make all the difference uh, in their lives. Uh, our, our pastor, our associate pastor, Josh, is going to bring that message. Uh, 
Really excited to hear from Josh today. Uh, right immediately following uh, the service, uh, there'll be an opportunity to gather in on Zoom uh, in what we're calling the lobby. Uh, really just a chance to connect. Uh, you can uh, ask some questions or comments about the message uh, of the day, but also just a chance to, to get together to catch up with friends and see how everyone is doing. Uh, and just a little special treat, you know, it's uh, coffee is always in need. We all feel a little bit weary these days. And so there's going to be a little raffle prize giveaway, uh, which Josh will be leading. So you don't want to miss that. Um, everyone loves a cup of coffee now, especially since these cooler nights are coming in with the fall. Really, I'm just joking. It is like 105 right now. Um, we have small groups. I was really excited to have those started uh, just last week. Uh, we have online small groups and we have in-person small groups with uh, some social distancing. Uh, you can sign up online for those and we'd really uh, encourage you to do so, especially if you're in a place where uh, you're feeling ready to come out and kind of get together uh, in person with people again. Uh, sign up online uh, for those. And we are super excited to actually have a regathering of the church again at a very special event. We're calling New Song on the Lawn, and it's uh, on Sunday, October 25th. And there's two different uh, chances to gather, one at 3 o'clock and one at 5 o'clock. And you can register online for that. Uh, we're also looking for volunteers to help because uh, in these times, with a lot of the extra things we need to do, we need kind of all hands on deck. So if you want to participate, then please contact us and offer your uh, service as a volunteer to really make this a special time. We're going to be gathering. Uh, not simply for ourselves, but we're going to be gathering for our community's sake. We're going to have a chance to pray uh, for the communities around our church. We're going to have a chance to pray for one another, a chance to, to worship God together, a chance to have communion together, and to hear about some of the vision that is around uh, what is happening around New Song Church. And we're really excited just to have a chance to be together again right here on the campus. We continue to be a church and a community that, that wants to do some things and wants to do them well. Uh, really, we want to follow Jesus. That is what we're all about. Uh, he is the unique person in all of history uh, and all of the cosmos uh, to whom we are called uh, into fellowship and to follow him. And it makes sense of all of life. Um, we are called to do what is a natural outgrowth of that, which is what he did so well and does so well, and that's to love people and to love people well. And also that should lead to us doing good in our world. And, and all of this really is the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, who is God and who is God with us and who is God who changes, transforms us, grows us, teaches us, comforts us, guides us. Uh, and we are so overjoyed to be able to do that in partnership with people all over the world. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we heard from the Levies in France. Last week, we heard from uh, Luke Kabongo in South Africa. Uh, and then today, we're going to hear from uh, Joe Smith. Joe and Emily are up in Portland, Oregon. They're going to read our scripture today and just give us a little update on what they're up to up in Portland, uh, where it is most definitely not 105 degrees and where coffee is going to be a big part of their lives. Uh, we're really grateful for them. And as part of this whole concept of studying a letter, a letter written by one person in the church to encourage other people in different uh, contexts, we're encouraging our people to do the very same thing, to kind of live out this letter, live out this uh, scripture by writing to uh, the missionaries and uh, servants of the Lord that we support and that we partner with. So uh, if you haven't yet written something to the Levies or to Luke, and then again this week to Joe and Emily, details are provided for you that you can do that. Write a note of encouragement or a prayer or something uh, that you think would be helpful for them, a bit of scripture, and bring them to the church or send them to the church, drop them in the church uh, mailbox, and we will send them all together uh, to our friends around the world. So grateful for uh, a chance to partner with them. Because really we believe that without the participation of God's people, we really are not a church. Uh, we're not being what God wants us to be. And it involves all of us uh, seeking to find where God would call us to participate uh, and to uh, uh, contribute to the work that God is doing. And, and one of the things that we don't uh, shy away from talking about is our financial needs. Uh, New Song continues to need the support of all those who are called together on this mission. And I just want to say, uh, after uh, sending a, a note out and just sharing where we were financially in the year, there was a tremendous outpouring of generosity from our people. And it was so encouraging to myself, to the staff, to the elders, to other ministry leaders, to see uh, that response. Because it tells us that people, even though we're somewhat isolated right now, people are there, people 
people are caring, people are praying, and people are taking seriously the call of God on their lives to participate in this particular embodiment of the kingdom in our community. So I just want to say a huge thank you to you. Let's continue to participate in all the ways that we can. Um, and I just I really, really want to emphasize um, that this is serious stuff we're doing. Yeah, we take this very seriously, and we want to use all of the resources that people bring uh, with wisdom and with discernment and with deep gratitude. Uh, so as we continue on together in this chance to hear from God and then to hear from one another, uh, will you join me for prayer? Father, Lord, uh, these are indeed uh, tumultuous times, times when many of us feel that we're being stretched too thin and sometimes it feels that there's just a great heaviness over everything. It's a time of of a great deal of conflict, a great deal of anxiety and fear. So we simply say today, Lord, we affirm that you are good. We affirm that you are leading us into what is best, not just for ourselves, but uh, for our place in our community and for the benefit of our friends and our neighbors, our families. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would use us continue to use us, continue to guide us and show us what new things you want to have born in us through this time of upheaval. Uh, we give you thanks for the opportunity to participate. Uh, we feel sure you could have done it better <laughs> than using frail, weak human beings, but this is what you do because this is about relationship and it's about fellowship and it's about a family. It's about a kingdom and a people. So Lord, bless each person who is hearing uh, these words today as your word is opened up and as Josh brings a message of hope. Lord, bless us as we bless your name, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, what's going on, New Song? I am Joe Smith, and my wife Emily and our two kids moved one year ago from Claremont to Portland to launch this brand new ministry that didn't exist at all, and now it's a coffee shop. This is it. I'm actually here. This is where the magic happens. Uh, we actually did it. Um, so thank you so much for, for praying for us and being with us in it and supporting us. It just it means so much. Uh, the fruition of all the things that have come about in that time has just been amazing. Um, you know, in a nutshell, like we just want the kingdom of God to come here in Portland as, as it is in heaven. And and uh, and we, we do that just by focusing so much on the Imago Dei. We just talk about that a ton. We want that to direct every conversation that happens, um, to ask the next question, to, to care for every person, to, to love people well, every single customer that, that comes through. We want them to feel that and uh, to lead to relationship and, and deep, amazing conversations uh, about life and meaning and truth and all of those things. And, and we also want to highlight the Imago Dei that is true of every person in the world. And so we're donating all the profits that come in to help in modern day slavery. We're giving it to International Justice Mission, the incredible work that they're, they're doing. So we're inviting the community into that too. And so it's just, it, it's saying people are valuable. Let's, let's value each other and humanize each other in the world that is so dehumanized and, and see what kind of good kingdom of God 
uh, expansion will happen as a result of doing that well. And so we're so excited. So many great and amazing things have been happening. Uh, and we're so thankful for that. So thank you for again for partnering with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your care and love in this journey of ours. Um, so we're going to be reading today too from the Bible together. Uh, so I'm going to be checking out First Peter one twenty two to two three. So let's go ahead and read that together today. This is the Word of God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen. Uh, may his upside down kingdom come at New Song um, and in the Inland Empire as it is in heaven. Well, God bless you guys. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Hey everyone, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at New Song and get the opportunity to jump in the series that we're going through in First Peter. I'm so excited that we're getting an opportunity to go through this letter. Uh, the series that we just went through, Words with Friends, um, such a good time to unpack these, these words that mean so much to our faith. But, but there's this challenge of the passage or passages that we picked. The, the amount of context and background and, and who was writing the message and, and to whom it was being received and, and all of that stuff, uh, it was a balance to, to how much we were able to unpack those things. And, and in this series, we get the opportunity to sit in this letter and build on our understanding of what Peter is saying. And I just think a couple months from now, how robust those messages are gonna be with all this context that we get to go through. And Grant uh, led us off with a couple of these messages. And one of the things that was unique in the first two messages that Grant pointed out was the fact that Peter was waiting to get into some of the direction and the correction uh, of this letter, that he was spending intentional and significant time focusing on the, the, the core principles of what is the most important thing in all of this because he knew that he wanted that to be the lens through which the rest was received. And that most important thing was the event of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the reality that came after that and the reality of our stance before God in that and, and his audience as he's speaking to them is, is being folded into this, this bigger story this heritage and this history of a God that pursues his people. And it's this beautiful story that, that he then brings into because of what Jesus did, our stories and our backgrounds and the thing that led to that moment in our life and how those two interweave with one another. And the reality of, of the, the presence that we feel with that and the reality of the sense of, of peace and belonging and purpose and direction that comes with that. And just a really important thing for Peter to solidify in this passage. And, and all those things, Grant said, have, have a result. And that singular result is worship. And worship not in the, the gathering of people or the proclaiming uh, who God is with the accompaniment of music or, or a message or small groups or programming, but, but the proclamation of who God is with our life and the way that we are. And that's the result of all these things. And today we get the opportunity to, to see Peter bridge the gap, not only of the collective to the individual, uh, but from from this foundational principle to what do we do with this? To, to pointing out the realities that we find ourselves in and, and how we should respond. And again, we were so blessed to just hear uh, this passage read 
um, by the Smiths and, and be able to hear uh, missionaries come in and read some of these passages as they're reading these same things and ministering to people in their context the same way that we are. And it's, it's really cool to realize we're a part of a bigger movement and a bigger story that God is writing. And so we're going to jump back into the passage uh, in verse 22. It says, having purified your souls by the obedience to truth. And, and when I read this passage, there was a couple of things that popped out. One is the main tension of the passage. And the main tension is in light of all these things, this beautiful story that I've just presented to you, you also are dealing with reality. This is a church in exile. This is a church from, from extra biblical sources that is going through crazy persecution and difficult times. And so they're told all these wonderful, beautiful things about what God did and the story they're a part of. But then they put, pick their head up and look at their reality and they're surrounded by craziness and chaos. And, and and there's this tension of this reality mixed in with the reality that they face every day and how to deal with that and what to be aware of. And that's what Peter digs into in this passage. But another thing that came up as I read this passage is it felt like Peter was leaning towards this doctrine of, of a works-based justification or a works-based righteousness. And it's when he uh, switches from the collective to the individual and says, having purified your souls by your obedience to truth. Wait, how do I purify my own soul? And, and so I was like, okay, what is this truth that he's talking about? And I think our inclination sometimes is to think, when we think of truth, we think of this, right? It's God's word, it's God breathed, it's truth. And, and, and that's true and those things are true. But this didn't exist when this letter was written. That, that what we call the Old Testament is the only thing that exists and, and they viewed it as the law and the prophets and the Torah. And the reality is they didn't have one of those sitting on their bedside table or on their bookshelf. That most of them never even had the opportunity to read it themselves, but it was, it was read to them in the synagogue and in those settings. And, and we realized that, okay, what is this truth he's talking about? So we find the context of what Grant went over and, and he uses obedient two other times, and that's it in this letter, and it's in this context, as obedient children. And he uses this analogy through this, that we are reborn when we accept what Jesus has done, and that, and that we uh, have this new state, this new life, this new way of being that comes. So, so we're obedient children of God. And, and at the beginning, it says in verse two, for obedience to Jesus Christ. And we realize whenever Peter is talking about obedience in direct correlation with our relationship with Jesus. So what this passage is saying is having purified your souls by the submission to the lordship of Christ, to the place that Jesus holds in our life because of what he has done. And that makes more sense. And, and that's something that we can get behind. And, 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 it, and it correlates with a lot of the other things we see in scripture. And, and he goes on to say this word, and it's one of the most powerful words that we find in scripture. All these beautiful things, the beginning of this first chapter in Peter leads up to this word, which is for. All those things are true for a purpose. And the for is for a sincere brotherly love. And, and, and this uh, translation says brotherly love. Uh, other translations say for a sincere love. But we did, uh, when we did words with friends, I got to go over the word love and how there's, there's a couple different uses or a couple different words for love in the Greek. And we have two of them here. And the first one is Philadelphia. And that's why this translation says brotherly love. And so what this is saying is that all this is true so that we'll have sincere brotherly or sibling love. And so we ask the question, what does that look like? And, and so you just think of any siblings you've seen. And what do siblings do? They fight. They disagree. They're kind of almost combative towards each other sometimes, right? You see them and they're like, they're tripping the younger brother and hiding his toy so he gets upset and, and this craziness. But another thing we see is when that older brother steps off the bus and he sees his younger brother getting picked on by some kids that are even bigger than him. It's go time. No questions asked. Earlier in that day, he, he was messing with his brother and teasing him, but, but he gets to do that, but no one else does, right? 
and we realize that even though there's disagreements and, and there's this combative nature sometimes and there's this different personalities that are involved, that at the end of the day, there's this belief and trust that he has his back and his brother has his back. And I think that this is seeing into a heart of Peter for the church. And we might even think it's a little idyllic in his understanding and and what if that was true about the church, these, this group of people that he's speaking to that comes from different cultures, different socioeconomical standing, different religious backgrounds, different political stances that are coming together, that are still disagreeing and, and, and battling and arguing, but at the end of the day have a deep resounding understanding that they have each other's back, that there's a thing of most importance that ties them together, that makes these other things peripheral. And that thing is found in verse 21 that Grant said that through whom, through him, Jesus, are believers in God who raised him, Jesus, from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And we see that this is the foundation that makes it capable for this sibling, this connection, this familial connection that we have with other believers, even in light of some of our other disagreements and how important that is and how much he's going to dig into that because that's not only a way to get along, but it's central in the mission of God. And he goes on to say, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And when we read this with just love, we feel like it's redundant a little bit. But this love is agapeo and this is the God love and this is the love that pursues relentlessly, that looks out and has an inclination for, for a kind and, and empathetic response of the person. It's a love that, that, is, that is unyielding, that is unconditional. It's not about what that person brings to the relationship or what I bring to that relationship, but there's intrinsic value in that relationship as it is. And this is beautiful idea of love in the context of this brotherly love that we would pursue each other. And, and I read a description of this love and kind of what it looked like. And, and it said that this has more of a meaning of satisfaction than it does a te- affection. And I, I just realized how big of a deal that is that it's not about how I feel about this person or how I feel in the situation, but it's a deep resounding belief and value of the satisfying relationship because it's not about what either party's bringing, but it's holy sacred ground that isn't possible outside of what Jesus did. And this is what we're called to church. This is what, this is what Peter is excited about and believes in. And in verse 23, it says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And, and he says, not of perishable seed. And he's going to talk in the next couple of verses about what the perishable seed is, but the imperishable. And, and he defines the imperishable seed as the living, breathing, as the living, abiding word of God. And, and we'll see this word, word, three times in this passage. And each time it actually has a different connotation. And even in the original writing, it's a different word sometimes. And this one uh, is from the word in Greek, logos. And logos is the word that we find at the beginning of the gospel of John, where he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was God and the word was with God. And he's talking about the person of Jesus. And, and, and you even go back to the beginning of scripture that it was the logos. It was God speaking things into being that, that logos is the origin of creation, that logos is the origin of, of sanctification, that it's the origin of our salvation and our redemption. And it's that that's the foundation, that's the bedrock, that's the platform that we rest in. And he brings that back up because we are so in desperate need of reminding ourselves of that, of remembering the reality of our foundation and where that comes from. In verse 24, it says, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. All flesh is like grass. And, and what this is, is actually a quotation uh, from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40. And this is the beginning of the suffering servant, which is believed to be a prophecy of Jesus. 
And the context of what is written is it's written to these people that have been exiled. These people that are aliens in the place that they live and don't feel like they belong. And, and it's, a, it's a writing that's meant to encourage them and to give them a hope of salvation. And, and so it's intentional for Peter to put it in this letter to this church that's experiencing the same things. And he says, all flesh. And, and flesh in that time would be understood as, as the inclination that we have as people towards sin, a propensity of sin that we have. And, and again, we belittle sin when we think that sin is as simple as a wrong action right? There's, there's the God or the right action, and then there's the sin or the wrong action. And when we choose the wrong action, we sin. And, and I think that we belittle the reality of what sin is when we think of that, because Romans 3 again reminds us that we're under the power of sin. And what that means is that there's a force, there's powers and principalities that, that are actively trying to corrupt and corrode and distort and pervert that which God made beautiful. And that starts in our identity and who we are. And there's these forces pulling at us and there's forces that are getting at us in the midst of this. And and we need to remember that and that we have that propensity and that it's not just simple. We don't just ride on our faith, but there's a constant battle that's happening. And, and he says what this perishable seed looks like, that all flesh is like grass and, and budding grass of flowers. And, and in the arid desert land that they lived, you don't see grass and you don't see flowers unless it's right by a source of, of water and life. And so, so it represented this kind of flourishing and this thriving reality. And what he's doing is he's setting up a contrast. He's stepping into reality with these, this group that he's talking to. And he's saying, hey, I get it. We say all these things are true, but you realize the gunk and, and, and the difficulty and the pain and the toil of your life. And you look around to all these people who aren't following Jesus and everything seems great. And what he's saying is that that, that is the, the grass and the flowers and those things will perish. And the reason that he's saying that is because the reality is we are all, and we know this about ourselves, we're all kind of playing a game. And I think for us specifically in Western culture and maybe even in Southern Californian culture, we believe that the game that we're playing is to have it together. And these are to good ends, right? To have it together financially and, and, and with food and money and, and, and housing and, and education and all these things and spiritually, right? With, with our faith and with what we understand and with the lack of questioning that we have and we have it together. But the reality is, is the real game that we're playing is because this is the area of least resistance is the game of making people believe we have it together. And Peter brings this up and he will attack this in this next thing because he knows that this is the foothold. This is the source of starting to erode that which God made beautiful and turning it into something twisted that, that there's this separation that happens. And, and I think about the, the, we look around and we see flourishing and thriving and then we think the mess of our life and, and it makes it difficult. And the other day, Lindsay and I were uh, getting ready. I was getting ready to head to work and she was heading to a meeting and we had a sitter coming. So we were cleaning up for two or three hours before the sitter got there because we have three kids and we both have full-time jobs and our house is a mess some of the times. Like it just is. Sorry, that's how it is. And so we're cleaning up. And, and the funny thing is we spend all that time cleaning. The sitter walks through the door and the first thing out of our mouth is sorry about the mess. And in teaching team, I sat there and I mentioned that thing that happened and I thought of how profound of a statement that is, not only for our home, which it is for our home too, and, and home is a sacred place and, and sometimes we worry too much about the mess to allow people into that, but, but for our lives. That if for some reason, whether by accident or intentionality, that someone sees the mess that is our life, we feel an obligation and a deep desire to apologize for it because we know it's getting that mud on their pristine flowers and grass. And, and it's scary and it's a scary place and a vulnerable place to be. And so we guard against it. But what Peter's saying is those things maybe won't always be the thing that you think they are. 
And I think of the mom that is like the super mom, right? Getting kids to where they need to go and, and, and working hard and, and getting some education on top of it and, and doing all the other tasks that the mom has to do. And we see that and we envy that and we're like, that's amazing. But what we don't see is that she's at the end of her rope and that that night she wonders how she's gonna make it through tomorrow or maybe next week or maybe the year after and it's exhausting and it's not because she's being fake, it's not because she's being hypocritical, but the world around her has told her that's how she's supposed to respond, that she desperately needs to offload some of that weight, but it doesn't look like it's okay. And, and, and Peter is saying like, we have to be aware of this. We have to fight for this. It's not a guilty thing, it's an intentional thing. And he goes on to say that those things will, will fail and fall away. But in verse 25, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word, so, so this word, I said there were three different things. So the word of the Lord, and this is a quotation, and this word is rhema. And it actually means a, a proclamation or a statement or a promise of God. And, and for the Jewish people, this was important. This was got them through the Red Sea and, and through the time in the desert and out of slavery and, and believing and trusting in the statements and the promises and the word of God. And then we fast forward to Peter and he said, that rhema and this word is the good news that was preached to you. And the word for good news here is actually euangelion and it's the word word that we translate a lot of the times as gospel. So, so again, it's not the fullness of all these things, but it is the thing of most importance. And that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that he pursued death on our behalf, embodied sin, and allowed the fullness of God's wrath to be poured out on that on the cross and buried all that and left it there after three days. And it's that that we abide in. It's that which remains forever. And it's that which we need to remind ourselves because there's a battle happening and we can't get that out of the forefront of our mind to know that that's what Jesus did. And it's not just the result of something that happens in the future, but that's the reality of now. And so he's passionately pointing these things out and we see him go in chapter two um, and he, he makes a pivot here and he changes from, from the collective to the individual realities and, and the things of most important to some correction and some direction in life. And so he goes in and he says, so put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And we have this list and, and before you do what I do normally when I read a list and, and think of, okay, which of these can I check? Oh, I struggle with that and, and think of a way to work on them. This is a super small list. There's so many more things that could and should be on here. But there's a reason that he's focusing on these ones. There's something that tie all of these together that's solidifying the point that he's trying to get across before he goes into more of the direction for their life. And this is an important thing. And, and it's not just about these individual things, but it's about what all of them have in common. And the two things are, are the source of these things and the result of these things. And we're going to unpack them as we go through it. The source of this we see and put away all malice. And what is malice? Malice is the literal ill will you have towards another person or persons. It's actually where you kind of hope the worst for that person or the worst for that group. And, and it seems extreme and it seems intense, but, but we see this more and more. And it becomes easier when we, when we uh, dehumanize a person to, and we simplify them to their thought, their opinion, their stance, their political view, their, their moral view, all of those types of things. And, and it becomes easier to kind of dislike it, because we really aren't hating them. We really aren't uh, hoping the worst on them. We're hoping the worst on what they believe. But they're tied to that. And, and how do we get there? How does that even happen? And this is where the origin of these things come in. And it happens when we fall into selfishness and, and, and being focused on ourself and, and, and what we're doing. And, and it's that pull that's happening in our life, right? This, this power of sin that's trying to corrupt the identity that we have in Jesus and say, yeah, cool. I love that you have your religion, but it's not enough. But look at all the ways that you fail. 
are you really a child of God? And, and it tears away and it's eating at that. And when we find ourselves in that, there's a response. And that response is to start finding our way, resolidifying our purpose and, and our direction and our belonging. And the only way to do that is to compare and look around and say like, oh, at least I'm not as bad as that person or, or that person is better than me, but I don't really like that. And they probably cheated to get, and, and we find ourselves in this and it can lead to malice can lead to ill will towards other people. And the next one is, and deceit. And this one's at the core of who we are, lying. And what's the point of lying and being deceitful? It's to sidestep the punishment and the guilt and the shame of doing something wrong. And Reed's hitting this age where it, uh, he would walk out of the kitchen, he has something behind his back. And I'm like, hey, buddy, what's behind your back? And he's like, not anything. And I'm like, buddy, that's lying. Like, you, you know, like, just let me see what it is. And, and, and we'll hear the babies cry and we'll come out and we'll be like, hey, buddy, what happened? And he'll be hiding under a blanket, not anything. And then I find him in the kitchen with the gate closed and he can't get in there except for climbing over it, which isn't safe and he's not supposed to do. And I'm like, how'd you get in the kitchen, buddy? And he's like, not anything. And we see this at the core of him dealing with this reality of trying to hide the shame and the guilt and trying to sidestep the punishment that might come. And it's at the core of who we are. But more than that, it creates a reality for the person that's hearing the lie. That if we really trust each other, it paints a picture of something that isn't true and that has a result. And it goes on to hypocrisy. And hypocrisy, we belittle hypocrisy as well if we think it's just the person who proclaims to be a good person or a good Christian person, but we know they do terrible things or they do bad things. And just think about that mindset for a moment. Just think about how counter to everything that Peter is saying that is, that we view that and say that's true. Say it's 100% true. This is a person that goes to church every week, leads a Bible study, but we know they make some poor choices. What if instead of looking at them and critiquing them and, and feeling like they're being hypocritical, that we saw them and we say what in their story, what pain in their life is causing them to, to, to create these lies, to create this facade and to do it so poorly? And it changes our mindset. But, but what this is, is actually it's in a reference to, to people who are in plays and when they would put on a mask and it wasn't just that, but they would embody a character. And what that does is, is it actually has an effect that what you're doing is you're painting this reality, this picture for people that is, that is the grass and the flower and, and, and that's all they see. And that's creating a bad reality for them to compare themselves to. But even worse than that, it's making a reality to where you know that they don't know the true you. And if they did, they would be appalled by how disgusting it is and, and how much you're failing. And, and it makes you feel more and more alone. And it isolates you. And, and I, think, I think about how this is in our culture and how this transcends. And, and it's easy to critique uh, young people nowadays and the social media platforms, right? You have Instagram, you have Snapchat, you have TikTok and, and, and we know and we can say logically like these are, these are unfair snapshots of this perfect moment in someone's life or of this, this witty comical statement that was said or this choreographed dance or event that's happening and, and we can talk about how bad that is for them to intake and, and, and how negative and how, how that can actually cause separation rather than uh, uh, socialization with people. And, and before we critique, and maybe you don't post, and maybe you just do the same thing on Facebook, uh, maybe we don't even post on any social media platform. But with our life, what's the picture that we're creating, that we're allowing other people to see? What's the, the, the quick joke that we have at hand when someone talks about something that's uncomfortable to sidestep the awkwardness? What's the choreographed response we give to people, even within the church, to give just enough transparency to satisfy the moment? When people come to me and ask, ask how we're doing, how the twins are going, and uh, oh man, they're, they're, they're keeping us on our feet, they're running us wild, but we're good, right? So it's just, it's just enough transparency. To, to suffice the situation, 
but then to veil it. And, and the reality here is not to, to feel guilt or to, to get upset at someone for acting in this way, but to have compassion and be aware that this is how we respond. And this isn't something that finds itself on the outside of church, but it finds itself inside church too. And we need to fight against that because those things create the separation. And he goes on to say, and envy And envying is envying someone's stuff or their power or their money, or it could even be an experience they got to travel or or their, their family. They have such a cool family. Whatever it is, we envy. And there's only two responses to envy. We either, when we envy something, we... We either belittle ourselves and say, you know what? They got to go to Paris because they worked hard and I don't deserve it. And I'm lazy and it's my fault and I'm a terrible person. Or the flip side that, that, oh, it's just data's money. They didn't earn it. They're spoiled. And, And either way, what we're doing is we're creating a narrative that separates us from that person, that separates that person from their humanity, from the fact that they're a child of God more than they are getting to experience this thing. And so we see why envy is a problem and we get to slander. And he wraps it up with slander and and slander seems harsh, right? Very few of us are gonna straight up say like, oh, that person's a terrible person. No one likes him and and he's ridiculous. She's ridiculous. But, But we're more cunning than that. And we use our situations in life to be that way. And let me give an example of, oh, did you, did you hear what happened to the so-and-so family? Yeah. Did you hear what the dad did? Right. And, and the reality is in our Christian culture, that's going to come, there's a prayer request that's coming now. So, so it makes it okay. We'll move past like the slight gossip that might be, you know, we're okay with that. We'll move on. But then this statement comes out. I always thought that he was just such a strong Christian man and veiled in our religion and veiled in prayer and even veiled in an affirmation of the person is a deep cutting slander that the only reason you say it is to whether you know it or not put you on the rung above them. And the more, the better of a person that they are, the higher you're climbing on that thing. And we don't want to think that way. And we want to believe the best in ourselves, but that's reality. And that's what it's doing. And it's not for you to feel guilty if you've ever found yourself in that situation, but it's for you to be intentional. Peter's saying, don't let this be because there's something more at stake than your rapport. This is the movement and the mission of God is at stake. It goes outside of you. It goes outside of this individual relation. It's it's a bigger than that. And he wants you to know that. And all these things have something in common. And one of the things that they have in common is their origin, which is the selfishness, but it's also their result. And the result is isolation. And it's separation and it's tearing at the fabric of what God created, this holy sacred ground of a union between two believers, between in the body of Christ, the, the fullness of, of, of God, who is, who Jesus is the head, that, that fullness that it, that it corrupts that and it tears away at that. And, and the reason that that's a big deal is that stands out in the world is that exists nowhere else in the entire world other than in a relationship of agape that's made possible through Jesus. And this is why it's so important for Peter. And he makes a hard pivot at the end as we wrap up with this verse, these verses. From correction to direction. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This pure spiritual milk kind of threw me off and I'm like, what is that? Is that just like a really intense Bible study or worship session or or some other form of fasting or spiritual discipline? And it's actually a different word than that. It's only used one other time in scripture and it's actually translated as reasonable. So what this is saying is long for pure, reasonable sustenance. The tangible thing that's going to allow you to sustain in the reality that you experience in this, in the situation that you have where you're exhausted with your family, where you're in a pandemic, where you're worried about your job, where you're worried about kids and family and all these different things. The thing that actually gives you life and actually sustains you. And he gives the answer to what that is. And one of the answers is the church. It's this sacred space that we get when we, when we collaborate, when we connect with people. 
And it's an opportunity not only to be affirmed and, and to gain something, but, but have purpose in our interaction with them when we agape them, when we say you're so much more than just your actions or what you bring to this, that there's value in who you are as a child of God, as a brother or sister in Christ. And then, okay, so what do we do? How do we do this? What's the tangible thing? And I think it's this. What if we, in our intentionality to try to, try to live into this, what if we let people into our mess? And not just the mess of our house. And maybe it is, maybe that's the starting point. But, but what if we let people into the mess of our life and we intentionally do it over and over and over again? So much so that we get to the point where we no longer feel obligated to apologize for it. What beautiful life is that? What amazing picture of God's presence, the kingdom of God on this earth is that? How freeing is that? And it's not just this utopic concept that we get, but it actually leads into our sense of purpose and belonging and identity. And it ends with this, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, that what Peter is trying to say, what Paul tries to say, what all the scripture is saying, that we actually get to participate in the ability of other people to taste the goodness of God. And we do that by, by, our, by our vulnerability, by our transparency and saying that I know I don't have it all together. And, and we might be scared that we might drag Jesus' name through the mud, right? I'm a pastor, I should have it more together. And, and if I share my difficulties, then how could anyone think that any of this is real? Wait, Jesus is way bigger than my ability to do anything with his name. And my rapport isn't what at, what's at stake here. The movement of the kingdom of God is what's at stake here. And my identity isn't what's at stake here because it's founded on the consistent living and abiding word of God. And so today, if you have tasted that the Lord is good and maybe it was years and years ago and it's been a long time, maybe it was the last week and you just experienced that again, whatever it is, I wanna encourage you to lean into this passage, to bring the gospel in the forefront of your mind and remember the reality of what Jesus did and what that means for you and how you stand before God. Because if you don't, the enemy is going to sneak in and he's going to find a way to corrupt what is true and what is beautiful and what is perfect. And we need to remember that. And I would challenge you to be bold in that and to take risks and to allow people into that mess, not just for you, not just for them, but for the revealing of the kingdom of God in a world that desperately needs it. And if you haven't tasted that the Lord is good, maybe you're watching this on a request from a friend or you're, you're just looking for something and you don't even know why or, or you're just hanging out with someone, everyone's watching this on the couch, whatever it is that, that you haven't tasted it, can I encourage you in something? Peter spent a significant portion of time focusing on what was of most importance. And that thing that was of most importance is the fact that Jesus pursued death on our behalf, that he lived that perfect life and that he took on all of sin and all of wrath for our sake and buried it and rose again three days later. Not so one day you'll get to experience eternity with God, but so right now you could offload the weight that you've been carrying. You can realize that it's not up to you to carve out your purpose and your standing in this world, but that has been solidified in what Christ has done. And, and can I encourage you in one other thing that, that if you're having a hard time with it, if you don't really buy into how you've seen Christi Christianity play out, if you're not sure about this book that, that has some things in it that you might not agree with, if, if there's some doctrine that you're uncomfortable with, please don't let that stop you from the thing of most importance, which is what Jesus did in your life, which, which is this, this story of God pursuing you not to make you more Christian or moral or a better person, but to free you to be the person he created you to be, which is beautiful and unique and essential to his mission. All the other stuff, I'm not saying throw it away or be blind to it. Bring it up. Let's have those conversations. That's fine. But please don't let it stop you from focusing on what's most important. 
So I just encourage us as, as we dig deeper into this letter, that this would be the lens through which we function, that we would both be encouraged by the reality of what God has done and uncomfortable with the reality that we sit in so that we, we move towards something that's better and that we find ourselves in that consistent tension that helps us grow and offload and develop into the salvation that God already has for us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. God, both the written word that, I, that I'm literally touching right now and, and the word that was talked about that, that focuses on the thing of most importance, which is the gospel and Jesus and that which is the origin of creation and that which is the origin of redemption and sanctification, Lord. Lord, that word. And I pray for everyone that's receiving this, Lord, wherever we're at, that you would affirm that in us, that you would make us intensely aware of these things that are trying to tear at what you have created and distort it. So guard these families, these fathers, these mothers, these brothers and sisters and and cousins and friends and uncles and all of the people who are represented. Guard them as they live in the reality that they live in. Let them forever come back to the the grace that we can experience in your presence and embolden us to create those places, sacred places of unity between people that aren't made possible except through what you did. So we give these things to you in your name. Amen. It is our firm conviction uh, that the God that whom we worship is a God who speaks, who is always speaking, who desires to communicate with, with people. Uh, and so we believe, actually, in the preaching of the word, uh, that God has an opportunity, uh, even beyond the preacher's skill and ability, to, to speak directly to our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and that elicits and should elicit a response from us as the, as the creatures responding to their creator. I just want to suggest some ways in which we might respond today. Uh, to what we have heard and to what we've encountered. 
the first is just quite immediate. Immediately after this um, uh, time together, uh, there's an opportunity to, to click on a link that will take you to a Zoom meeting, which we're calling the lobby. Uh, so I'd really encourage you to do that. And once again, you, know, you might be in for winning a, a delicious coffee prize, but uh, I would love to see more people uh, take advantage of that. You can stay as long or as short as you want. Um, first thing, you just get a chance to share some of your responses about the message. But more importantly, just a chance to check in with your brothers and sisters in Christ and see how everyone's doing. Um, so join us for that. Another way you might want to respond is if you feel there's something you'd like to discuss with a pastor. And Melody, Josh, and myself are all available uh, to set aside an allotted uh, portion of time and have a phone call where you can just share what's going on with your life, uh, receive prayer, and receive uh, some uh, resources if, if that's required. We'd really encourage you to do that. Uh, uh, if you've never given a, a, a chance before, just connect and you'll get some time there and a chance to be uh, prayed with and prayed for. Uh, also, uh, prayer, as we've said so many times, we believe it's the beating heart of our ministry. It's prayer is the central, most important thing that we will do if we're to be healthy in our community and as we seek to follow God in, in the way he leads us. We have several opportunities for that. Uh, please uh, post something on the prayer wall. You can do that anonymously or you can give your details. And that's becoming a really active place uh, where people are being prayed for. Also, every Wednesday evening, Sonia Kukuchilo is leading us in a prayer meeting on Zoom every Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that to register and get the link. Uh, I'd encourage you to do that. It's been an amazing time uh, of, of prayer together. Thank you for all those who've been participating in that. And I'd encourage all of us to, to, to check that out. Uh, right in the center of the week, a chance to gather together for prayer. Also just want to give everyone a heads up about an exciting thing that's coming soon. You know, we've said that uh, in this season, rather than be uh, using all of our efforts and energies to sort of recreate what we did prior to this pandemic situation and uh, to gather uh, with all the protocols and things every single Sunday, we've actually sought very, very intentionally uh, to let God show us other areas where energies can be used to, to let new things be born among us. Uh, and so a couple of these things we've mentioned a few times is the garden and the pantry. And both of those ministries have been really blossoming in this time. But uh, realizing that uh, many of you have not had a chance to actually observe much of that, uh, we have a uh, soon to announce uh, an open house with a chance for people to come and observe what has been going on, the, the changes and the growth of both these ministries, to hear from some of the leaders in these ministries, and also an opportunity to pray for them and pray for the people uh, actually who are participating currently as far as guests at the pantry, but also those whom we have not yet connected with to pray into that future time um, and to have a chance also to, to bring your resources and your time and participation into those ministries. So we're going to announce that soon, so super excited for for that. Uh, I hope this has been an encouragement to you uh, and hope you have really truly heard from God. Uh, let's keep talking about what's happening in our lives. Uh, let's keep in touch through all the ways, the amazing technological ways that we can continue to be in touch. Sign up for a small group if you haven't yet. And I pray that you have a wonderful week and that you experience the riches of God's grace for you.